Coach and Goal Line Extended presented by Lacrosse Flash. What is going on, Lacrosse fans? Welcome to Goal Line Extended on the Lacrosse Flash Podcast Network. Today is Friday, August 6th, and I am your host, Ryan Holstbus. Glad that you could join us, whether you are watching or listening, either on YouTube or on any podcast platform, as we are set to look ahead to next weekend's week eight in the Premier Lacrosse League, the final weekend of the regular season from the capital of the great state of New York, Albany, New York, at the University of Albany as the PLL continues its 2021 tour, the regular season wrapping up this weekend following the bye week, and then we will be right into the playoffs with the quarterfinals set to start the following weekend from Salt Lake City, Utah, which we will talk much more about in a little bit as we have a lot to talk about today. We're going to start looking ahead to next weekend's games as, like I said before, a very important week eight for every single team as we have two teams playing an elimination game against each other for the final playoff spot. A handful of teams are still vying for that number one overall seed, which awards a free pass to Philadelphia for the semifinals in about a month. And then every team will be battling for seeding as no team has locked up a particular seed heading into Week eight, we'll see four teams play two games over the weekend. So there's still a ton of lacrosse left to play, a ton of movement that could happen. And it is something to watch heading into the weekend. All of that and more as we get rolling along on this Friday. Let me welcome in my counterparts for today's show. As in one corner, we have Flash analyst Harrison Silcox in the other Flash writer and analyst Jordan Johnson. Gents, how are we feeling on this Feel Good Friday? PLL trade deadline day which we will be diving right into in a moment. But how are we feeling today? Feeling good, brother. Yeah, uh, echo that. Uh, I'm excited. We're down to the stretch of the season here. Uh, trade deadline, we've already had some splash trades. So, I mean, it doesn't get better than this as, as far as how a season progresses. Big time flash trade. We were talking, or uh, we should say trade. We we were talking about it uh, on the PLL flash on Tuesday, right before this this trade was announced, and we were kind of like, do do we think something's gonna happen? Probably not. I know Jordan. We've been talking about it the last couple of weeks. Do we think something will happen? Probably not. But we do see a considerable, uh, considerably big trade, I should say, happen, and we will be diving right into that in a little bit. But as stated, we have a big weekend ahead of us next weekend with each game holding a lot of weight in terms of playoff scenarios. For almost every team, we'll get into all of that in a little bit, but we're going to start with today's trade deadline, which officially closes this afternoon, Friday afternoon at 2 p.m. Eastern time. We're recording this show Thursday afternoon, so we only have the one trade that we just mentioned that we will be getting into in a moment. But if anything does come up Thursday evening, maybe a late one on Friday morning, someone will hop on at the end of this show and give at least a quick breakdown of it. But the dead, uh, but the show should be posted, I should say, before the deadline. So if anything goes down after GLE is up right before the deadline, then we'll pick it up next Friday on Goal Line Extended. If it's really significant, expect a quick PLL flash at the top of next week. But let's get right into it as we got news of the second trade of the season break on Monday evening. The post-game podcast being the first to report it with the league and teams confirming it the following day. But the trade will see the Chrome send attackman Justin Gutterding to the Whip Snakes in return for defenseman Nick Grill. One for one, nothing else involved in this one, which came to the surprise of many, including myself and a few of us here at Flash, that you would give up a talent like Justin Gutterding for, frankly, a less desirable package in return. But I'll let you guys break it down first. And Harry, we'll start with you. Obviously, you look at the stats. Justin Gutterding has not had, you know, been having the greatest of seasons here in 2021, nor is a season that we're used to seeing from a player of his caliber. He's been held to just five goals, averaging a single point through six games, shooting at an 18% clip. And before sitting out of this weekend's doubleheader for Chrome, he was coming off back-to-back games where he failed to register a point. So it's no secret that Gutty hasn't been having the greatest of seasons. But then you look around at the rest of this offense. They're missing Jordan Wolf, who's you know, he's been out for the season after sustaining an injury in week one. Randy Stotts was scratched for the season after training camp. Jesse King has been held out due to travel restrictions. He hasn't seen the field yet. Matt Gaudette, who was on last year's attack line that was really successful in the championship bubble. He was suspended following the week one off the field incident. And then the midfield, for the most part, is still the same. But you look at those stat lines from that unit. And the only guy that that I can really say is playing really well, or not even really well, but well right now, is Jordan McIntosh. So not to make excuses, but the problems are kind of 
pretty glaring here right now for the Chrome. And that's only speaking on the offense. This defense has also been battered by injuries, but they have a lot of young talent that they're trying to plug and play. Now you bring in Nick Rill. This should play out well for them over the long term, even though I think there should have been more involved in the trade, which we'll get into in a moment. But right now you're trying to make the playoffs, trying to keep your season alive, Harry. But I don't know how much more Nick Rill helped you in one game, this elimination game, compared to how much Justin Gutterding not out there hurts you. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I kind of look at this. And I I like the trade. Um, I know a lot of people are are big criticizers of it, um, but I mean, the bottom line is Justin Gutterding hasn't been fantastic this year. Uh, I mean, you're talking about a guy who's had five goals and one assist. Uh, if the Chrome want to make a, the playoffs, I don't think it's going to go through Justin Gutterding this season. When you look at, you know, they have to win uh, in in the final week of play. And they have to win by, I think, eight goals is what it is, or seven goals. So, like, you're not going to get that with what Gutterding's been able to produce so far this season, especially, I mean, that 18% shooting clip. And they have talent on offense. We've seen this this team before uh, dominate the Whipsnakes earlier this season. And, by the way, they were coming off a bye uh, that week as well. I, I mean, this is an offense that still has guys like Colin Heacock, uh, they they've also got Jackson Morrill, who's been a really good rookie addition. They picked up Dylan Malloy, which was big news. Um, and so if it doesn't work out, guess what? You move on to next season. You're going to wind up with the number one overall pick, I believe. Um, and so then you can draft for that. And you're working on defense with Nick Grill, who, by the way, I think is a very good defenseman. That's just a crowded defense to try and break through as a rookie on that whip snakes roster. Um, so I think it's a play for the future without really giving up your playoff chances. I mean, a guy who scored six points on the season. I mean, I don't expect Gutterding to be the difference maker. If he was on this roster going into a matchup where, you know, you've got a minus 20 goal differential and you're going up against the team that's at minus 13. And, and that's, that could be a, a backbreaker for you as far as the playoffs go. So I don't think they're waving the white flag yet. I like the trade both for the future and for the fit of this team. Uh, to me, it makes sense. I mean, look, Connor Fields was an MVP candidate in year one. The dude faded in the bubble and wasn't the same player that he was. And so the chaos had to ship him in the offseason. People want to criticize that trade. I mean, listen, this league's about the right fit. It's about getting the right guys. And when you have a talent like Gutterding, yeah, he's really good. He's had some good seasons, but all of a sudden, five goals, one assist, uh, that's not going to cut it. And you're going into your final week. Maybe you give some more, you get him off the field, you give some more touches to guys like Dylan Malloy, Jackson Morrill, who knows where it could go. Absolutely. You, you, you know, I understand this trade, I think, in terms of how this helps the Chrome over the long term, as you were just saying there. You know, next season, we could see a defensive, uh, you know, pairing, really, of JT Giles Harris and Nick Grill there down low. But you look at this roster, Ned Crotty, Jordan McIntosh, John Rannigan, they're all in their 30s. Joel White and John Galloway are 32. Michael Manley's 33. Bernhardt's 30 and coming off this injury that's held him out since week two. So this makes sense definitely in the fact that next year, as I just said, we could see a defense made up of Grill, who was the 2021 Big Ten Defensive Player of the Year. JT Giles-Harris, the, no the 2021 number three overall pick. He's been held out all season due to that injury that he suffered in the NCAA Championship semifinal. And then hopefully we see a healthy Jesse Bernhard, Joel White, probably manning that LSM position, and then possibly another defenseman added during next year's college draft or the offseason. We're thinking the draft, if they lose this game, they would have the number one overall pick in next year's college draft. If they do end up winning, we could see them probably seated at six or seven. You know, and then obviously from there, we'll see how the playoffs shake out. They could get a, a, a two or a three spot if they lose. But obviously talking about the Chrome, we want to see them uh, probably turn it around. But I see the long-term benefit and even the immediate benefit kind of, of adding Grill to this defense, as you said. They've been battered by injuries all season. So adding him, slotting him in definitely does help. But what I question here is the package. You did mention it, but it's, it's just in guttering. Up until this spring, he held the NCAA all-time record in goals. In the PLO's inaugural season, he was second in the league in points. And at last year's championship series, he was top five in points. And a big reason why you could say, you know, the Chrome's turnaround from 2019 to 2020, you could say that Gutty played a big uh, big part. So I question the package, Jordan. I think Sudan could have gone a pick somewhere in the middle of next year's college draft in return for a player like Justin Gutterding. What do you make of this trade on the Chrome side as, as they look to make it a last-ditch playoff push here? I mean, look, could Sudo have gotten a better draft pick? Sure, but, you know, like Harry talked about, like you guys have been talking about, 
This is all Nick Grill's a player that can play, right? You look at that Whips defense there with Matt Dunn, Bryce Young, Colin Squires coming into his own as as a number four defenseman, Tim Moeller there, obviously, all the Maryland guys. So Grill is just really the odd man out. And if you're the Whips and you're able to trade him before potentially either losing him, whether the league expands possibly and losing him in the expansion draft or just having to cut ties with him in the offseason, you're able to sort of get ahead of yourselves, get a guy like Guttering who, depending on the status of Matt Rambo, whether Matt Rambo does play at some point this year, he can put, he can be a great off-ball guy that Rambo can feed, or if he has to slide into that Rambo slide attack, he's shown in the bubble that he can do that in the bubble and in the regular season of past in 2019, excuse me, that he can do play that role very well, sort of being all over the field as a mismatch, especially with a guy like Zed, who without Rambo was sort of has not gotten his usual looks. So overall, I like the trade for the whip snakes. At first I questioned it a little bit because I was like, well, could could uh if Rambo comes back, how would that play? And you know, really think about it. I think a lot of people forget how great of a feeder Matt Rambo is, you know, all of his goals make it on Sports Center and make the highlight packages. But don't forget that Matt Rambo is one of the best feeders in the pro game right now. And so having a guy like Gutty that when he comes back, he can feed the ball to also there'll be less pressure on a guy like Rambo when he comes back that <clears throat> he's not going to have to necessarily carry the load. The whips have been struggling, but as you guys mentioned, Gutty has been too. And maybe it just could be a new – just get a, give him a fresh start here early, late in the season. Uh, he'll most likely have Albany to sort of get his feet underneath him. And then, as we know, the whip snakes are most likely going to be headed to the playoffs. as, And so he can sort of just get on the roll right away in the playoffs. And so I really like this trade for both sides. I mean, and on the Chrome side, a defense potentially with Nick Grill and JT Giles Harris – even if some of those vets maybe retire, if you're able to keep one or two, uh, that's still a pretty good defense in my mind. Absolutely. We're, we're kind of looking at that that future uh, defense, the, just how they'll, they'll be built. Definitely something that we are looking at. Oh, this trade does make sense here. For the Chrome, I just, again, back to it. I, I truly believe that the Chrome should have received more in return here in this trade. I know you guys are kind of on the opposite end of me. Like I said, Harry brought it up there. Then again, we saw the same thing happen back in February when the Chaos sent Connor Fields to the Archers. One for one for do-it-all midfielder Ian McKay. And uh, we've kind of seen how that panned out. Obviously, Connor Fields kind of again put on the back burner in terms of just all the, the weapons that the Archers have offensively. But let's shift gears to the Whip Snakes end of this trade, even though Jordan did kind of get into it there a little bit as they send away their fourth round selection in April's college draft. Nick Grill, who has recorded three ground balls thus far this season in the two games that he's seen the field, which included a week three game against the Chrome, one where the Whip Snakes defense allowed 16 points, which was the Chrome's first one of the season and one of only two heading into week eight. But in exchange for Grill, the Whip Snakes add a very dynamic score in Justin Gutterding, as Jordan talked about before, to hopefully pick up the evidence slack that's been left behind by that absence of Matt Rambo, who we haven't seen since that week three game against the Chrome. He's been dealing with a wrist injury and his status for week eight is still unknown as the league did not release an injury report earlier this week. We'll see if they update it today ahead of the bye weekend, but we've also gotten some contradicting reports during the week, one saying that the injury might be worse than advertised, another saying that he could make his return come the uh, come the quarterfinals, possibly in week eight, uh, obviously quarterfinals being the hope though in two weeks. But as of right now, Matt Rambo is still listed as out on the league's injury report, and we'll take it as that heading into the weekend. But Harry, Gutterding is likely to step in and join Zed Williams and Jay Carlson down on that Whip Snakes attack for the Whip's final two games of the season and then for that quarterfinal round most likely. How do you expect Gutty, one of the game's best scorers, to fit in on this attack unit and in this offense? And what roles should he carve out for himself with these two games of prep ahead of the playoffs? Uh, it's it's tough to kind of estimate what kind of role, what kind of shoes he's going to fill. Uh, you would imagine this kind of tells me uh, that maybe the, the Matt Rambo injury uh, as much as unknown right out there right now and a lot of conflicting reports. It kind of tells me that maybe things aren't looking great for Matt Rambo um, when you trade for a guy like Justin Gutterding. Uh, I think he has potential to slot in this roster very well, uh, but I think it's going to be tough to match. Can he figure out 
the chemistry with this team in one final week of the regular season, right? They're going to come into that final weekend in Albany. They're going to get a few practices under their belts before they hit the field, and then it's playoff time. Uh, and when you look at the Whip Snakes, their offense hasn't been great. So um, you imagine adding a guy like Justin Gutterding will help. Uh, but again, his production this year hasn't been great. So th there's that gamble of, yeah, in past years, the numbers have been there for Gutterding. But this year, five goals and an assist, maybe you kind of question it. If that production stays the same when he comes over to your team that scored 11 goals in the last two games, uh, it's not going to be great for the Whip Snakes. And, and I think that um, this is probably the the least amount of confidence I've ever had in this Whip Snakes team since the league started, especially going into this postseason. I mean, they're they're not really peaking right now. This is a very unfamiliar look that I've seen from this team uh, again in the last three seasons. So it, it is kind of a gamble. You're banking on Gutterding finding the spark that he got back in 2019. Uh, when he was, you know, on the leaderboards, leaderboards and points and goals. Also, you know, back when he did it uh, in 2020 in the bubble in one less game than he's played so far this season, he had 10 goals and six assists back in 2020. So you're hoping that he's going to find that rhythm again, but how is he supposed to find that rhythm with limited practice time and not very much time left in the regular season? It's a gamble that I think the whip snakes, kind of need to pay off if they want to make that championship run. Again, we don't know the full details on Matt Rambo's status. This tells me it's probably not great at the moment. Uh, only time will tell. And when we get official word from the league, you know, we'll kind of have to see what happens in Albany and as we move into the playoffs. But yeah, I mean, Gutterding's really got to figure out, you know, where that momentum lies in the past two seasons that he's had and, and get it rolling for this Whip Snakes team down the stretch. You said it there. Very just, just I, I used the word unorthodox on Tuesday's PLL flash just to, to describe the uh, the Whip Snakes. Fifth place, back to back losses. Like you don't you don't usually you know associate those with the Whip Snakes over the last two years. The, the two time defending champions here of the PLL. So fifth place. You know, they, they got a minus, I believe, 10 or 12 goal differential, score differential coming in to this weekend. Something that they'll be able to try to fix with two games to be played. But, you know, we'll see how how they get it done this weekend. But I kind of compare this Whip Snakes team. You look at like I'm, I'm a New York Yankees fan. You know, obviously they have not been playing the Yankees up to expectation this season. They just went out, made two big trades to bring in two more big bats. You know, hopefully that'll that'll signal a turnaround. Kind of what I'm seeing with with the Whip Snakes. Kind of what we're seeing here uh, with Jim Stagnita's team as as they try to bring in you know that added jolt which Gutterding should provide here to this Whip Snakes offense, despite being held to just six points so far this season with the Chrome. But Jordan, you look at the Whip Snakes' last couple point totals. Harry did mention it there before, but seven goals in Week Five and a loss to the Redwoods before the All Star break, and then coming out of the break, they put up six and an embarrassing Week Seven loss to the Water Dogs. Jay Carlson, who I know you love, has actually played really well over that stretch. He scored two goals in week five and recorded a hat trick last weekend. But it's really the other pieces on this offense that haven't picked up the load, as Mackie Jenner talked about on the PLL Flash on Tuesday. Zed Williams in those two games, an assist in week seven. He was held pointless on Sunday morning, 17 shots combined over two games that haven't found the back of the net. Brad Smith was held without a point on Sunday as well. And then Mike Chaninchuk hasn't been able to find that same two-point success that he had the past two seasons. He's made just one two-point goal on 16 attempts. So the Whipsnakes bringing in a proven score in Gutterding. But how do you expect the rest of this offense, most notably Zed and Smith and Chaney, uh, to feed off what Gutty brings to the table, not just as a scorer but also as a feeder and in how he should help space the field? Well, you talk about this offense, man, and I think something that we haven't necessarily touched on is their transition from 2019 and from the bubble just has not been there. And look, I mean, a lot of coaches will tell you that games are won and lost in the middle of the field. Obviously, they have the guys that do it. Matt Abbott, Michael Earhart, who has not been himself this year at all. Um, if they are able to get that transition going, that can open up space for guys like Mike Chan and Chuck like Matt Habit, like a Michael Earhart to get a two-point. And that starts on defense, man. And their defense, they had struggled when Rambo first went out. Don't know, not any correlation there, but you talked about that game where they did give up 16 goals to the Chrome. And then they came out against the <clears throat> against the Archers, still had that little bit of well, – they struggled for a couple of weeks there, whether it was in goal or just defensively. They seemed like – 
against the water dogs that in goal it looked better. I think they can build upon that. I mean, and cut going into Albany, we'll see who the goalies are, whether Phipps comes back or not. Maybe they, like I said, I still hold it, or I still may think there may, should burn more, not play well. I still say you think about it if he's there. If he's not, obviously you ride with burn more. Um, but just defensively, you got to get better in that transition game because if the Whips are able to get that transition game going, they're a scary team, and we all know that, you know. And, and so at the end of the day, like you said, Mike Shannon Chuck not having his usual year. I still think if there is another trade to be made, it could be them going out and getting another guy that can sort of help them in the middle of the field and then transition. You know, maybe even potentially I think you can get use a guy like Colin Squires a little bit better. I think he can be sort of a threat like Earhart, and he's also a good fourth defenseman as we've seen. So that's what I'm really interested to see with, with the whips. Can they pick up that transition game? Because that will help ease a guy like Gutty in to, into the lineup. That will help – that will open up things for shooters like Zed. And so I think if you get that going, that could be the key to getting this offense going again. I talked about there, I mentioned that Nick Grill has only played two games this season for the Whipsnakes. Really, thanks in part because Colin Squires has been playing so well. Rookie out of Denver, uh, third round selection, I believe, by Coach Sagnita. So, obviously, Squires has been stepping up big for this Whipsnakes team, playing a role every couple times. Obviously, Earhart's missed time. Bryce Young has missed some time. So, stepping up was Colin Squires. Nick Grill kind of left in the back there in that, in that defensive group. He's obviously sent to the Chrome, but you also brought up the goalies there. We talked a couple weeks ago about whether we might see the Whipsnakes deploy a similar strategy as the Archers the past couple seasons if they use Burn Lore and uh, Brian Phipps in kind of a, a split And before role. people get on me with that, my whole logic behind that is that if you have a goalie that's giving up rut, that's going on a rut, is it necessarily on him all the time? No. No, but Sometimes. as we've seen with the Redwoods, and how it's worked. Think about the Redwoods, what they've done with a guy like Troutner over the last couple of years. He get, they get, a team goes on a big run for, for them. They sit him in the second quarter. They sit him to start the half. Gets his mind together. He comes back in the fourth quarter. He's lights out. And that could be a good system for that. It just gives a spark to them. And they have a capable goalie that can hold in there, like, like the Redwoods with Jack Kelly. If you have a capable guy that can hold it down, sort of allow your defense to get its swagger back, allow your team just to get that extra spark, I think it can work. It's not necessarily that you have to bench your guy the whole game, but you need a spark. And I just think that's one of the ways you can. When you have a goalie like Brian Phipps, that allows you kind of that freedom in order to do that. We were talking about this, though, before week seven, I believe, the show after uh, the All-Star break or ahead of the All-Star break. We were talking about this uh, possibility. And then, obviously, week seven, Brian Phipps did not dress uh, for the Whip Snakes as Reed Junkin got the uh, the backup spot in that game. I don't know if it was just a travel Congra thing or, or what. Congratulations Brian to Brian Phipps on having your kid on on having your kid that was the reason was that what why. It was? He, he that's what it was there we yeah. go so congratulations <laughs> to brian phipps now we know why he wasn't in there there uh on week yeah. seven but we'll see if he's out there for week eight helping this whip snakes team try to better uh where they are heading into the playoffs as the whip snakes as we talked about before come into week eight the final weekend of the regular season sitting in fifth place and they'll have two games left to play against the Redwoods on Friday night and against the Archers on Sunday as all three teams are currently tied at four and three heading into the weekend with score differential separating them and a great week could end with the Whipsnakes as high as possibly two or possibly as high as three uh, if everything kind of goes their way on the flip side they could also settle in at four or five if they can get at least one win a bad weekend could see them fall as far as the sixth seed as for the Chrome, they are a win and you're in scenario, or they are, I should say, in a win and you're in scenario for the final playoff spot. The highest they could get is the sixth seed if score differential goes their way, but a loss will see their season 
come to an end. But a lot of lacrosse left to play for both of these teams, especially the Whipsnakes. And we'll be talking much more about those matchups, those playoff scenarios, as well as the entire Week 8 slate next week on Goal Line Extended. But let's continue here and looking at some of these notable names still on that injury report. As for the Water Dogs, they were without Connor Kelly for the first time in Week 7. His injury listed as a lower extremity. And then attackman Michael Sowers, the second overall pick in this year's college draft, was held out for one more week in Week 7 after being removed from the injury report. He was listed as questionable going into the weekend, and we'll expect him to return from Week 1 or from, I should say, that week one injury that he suffered come week eight in Albany, as it looked like in the buildup to last weekend that all signs pointed to him playing in Colorado. Coach Copeland held the rookie out an additional week, and his team was able to get the win, and now they play for a chance to hold the top seed going into next Sunday, the final day of the regular season. They could do that with a win against the Atlas next Saturday. But Harrison, we're expecting that we'll see both Kelly and Sowers next weekend in Albany. Still question marks, as we haven't heard much regarding their statuses. We will, again, hopefully have updates next week. But this Water Dogs offense looking to get back the second overall pick. How do you expect his addition to add to and for the Water Dogs, hopefully continue this success that they ride into Week 8 with, coming fresh off a win against the two-time defending champs in a three-game winning streak heading into Week 8? Yeah, it just adds some more versatility uh, to the offense that the Water Dogs have. And I, th I think that's just a good way to describe their roster in general. Uh, I, I really feel for Michael Sowers this year. He makes his debut, uh, gets gets hit with uh, an, an upper body injury, however you want to describe it, um, takes a shot to the back of the head. And, and we haven't seen him since. Um, and, and he's a player who people have been really excited to see get into the PLL since you go back to – um, what was you know his undergrad senior season at Princeton before kind of the world came crashing down uh, on sports. So I'm I, I'm excited to see him personally. I think it adds a lot of versatility to the offense. I thought Sowers uh, won a lot of his individual matchups in his debut. He kept getting hit with some crease violations. Probably just you know the rookie getting used to you know the hits that come at the pro level as well as just kind of that crease dive that's a little bit different without the goal mouth that he dealt with at college. Um, my one question mark about this is how will he fit into a water dogs offense that I feel like has slowly found their identity as the season has gone on. And that means that they found their identity without Sowers on that team. And I'm not saying that Sowers is going to come in and make this team worse because, you know, mathematically by the numbers, a guy like that would make them better uh, with his presence on the field and just how athletic he is. But we've seen so much in the PLL where it's all about, you know, these locker room fits and putting putting the right guys together. I mean, the Atlas is a perfect example of it, right? They had so many superstars on their team in those first two years, and they don't start clicking until now when they kind of dump a lot of those guys through trades, and they and they get Jeff Teed, and they bring in Costa Beal, um, and they kind of switch things up, and they, they find the right fit and environment for that locker room. So can Sowers come in and continue to fit that mold that the water dogs have found here in the season? Um, and, and I think with him being a rookie is kind of why I question it a little bit more. Uh, Connor Kelly, you know, he's got some years under his belt, but uh, you know, Michael Sowers with the one game of experience with the water dogs and what was, I mean, not a good showing for them. If you remember that week one of the season, I just wonder, you know, how well he gets into the groove with the rest of that roster. But really, I mean, their strength too is just the versatility, you know, in transition going back and forth on defense and offense with, with guys like Ryland Reese and Zach Curry. Or so, so maybe he fits in at X, no problem. I, th I think I, no matter what, I, that team is better off with him on the field. It's just how much time is it going to take for him to get in the groove of things? And will it, Will it pay off come playoff time? The War Dogs will hope to get Connor Kelly and Michael Sowers back ahead of Week 8. Try to get one of their top midfielders and obviously their young top attackman back into the fold ahead of a playoff run. And we should have much more on both of their statuses next Friday. But midfielder Juice Snyder is also still on the injury report. He sent out pictures either on Instagram or Twitter of his face. Looks like he got some sort of surgery or stitches or something done during the month of July that held him out. We hope that he is obviously okay in his recovery. I don't know what his timetable looks like, but we hope for the best in his return. But Jordan, with these two pieces likely to come back for the Water Dogs, Kelly and Sowers, what do you see their chances at making a semifinal or a championship run in the playoffs look like as they come into Week 8 on a three-game winning streak looking to extend it to four? 
Well, you bring in a guy like Snyder. I mean, Snyder's just the ultimate pro's pro, right? He's been there. He's won championships. You can never go wrong with a guy like that, even if it, even if his on the field production is not necessarily what we're used to like that. Just having his presence in the locker room is just going to feel those guys, right? And we all know what he can do on the field. He's a great two point threat for the Water Dogs. He kind of gets things lined up in the midfield has that quarterback ish role when he's on the field. So a guy like Drew Snyder coming back is he's going to be a real huge piece for the water dogs here down the stretch, giving them a chance to make the playoffs. I mean, and obviously we know what Connor Kelly can do guy can fly out, shoot the ball. He's one of the best scorers in this league. He's going to get his points no matter what. So, you know, with these two pieces coming back, they're coming back at the right time for the Water Dogs, which is what you'd love to see, especially now that they've been on this role. I mean, sure, you can make the argument that you don't necessarily want to disrupt what they have, but these are two guys that, A, Kelly was a part of what they had, even when they lost back in Long Island. Kelly had eight points, and so he was just a part of that role. Him getting hurt was unfortunate for the Water Dogs, but they were able to weather through that. And then the guy, like I said, a guy like Snyder, who's won championships before with the Outlaws, won one with the Whip Snakes. A guy like him is only going to make your team better. So you can't go wrong with having these guys come back. We talked about how big this week is for the Whip Snakes and Chrome. Obviously, the Chrome needing a win to continue their season. But for the Water Dogs, a win, and they would go into Sunday as the number one seed. And then they would need to wait and watch as the Archers and Redwoods, as the Archers most notably have the score differential to take the top spot away from the Water Dogs. They would need to win on Friday night against the Chaos and again on Sunday against the Whip Snakes. That is the Archers if they want to take the top spot. Same goes for the Redwoods. They would need to beat the Whip Snakes Friday night and then the Chaos on Sunday. But the Woods would need some help in terms of the score differential. Long story short, if the Water Dogs win and the Archers and Redwoods both sweep their doubleheader, we could see four teams sitting at six and three with score differential then to decide the seeding in the number one spot as we head into and prepare for week eight we'll have much more on the seating and playoff scenarios especially for the archers and water dogs as well as the chaos uh who we won't be talking too much about today but let's continue on here as we'll move on to the atlas lacrosse club who currently holds the top spot in the league ahead of week eight riding a five game winning streak into albany new york but they have been without starting goalie jack concan in the past two weeks who's been out with an a, a, a groin injury leaving back up J.D. Colarusso to step in and fill the void between the pipes. And my God, has Colarusso done a great job the past two weeks in cage for the Atlas. He goes 3-0 and in positions. Ben Rubier's team just a win away from clinching a bye through to the quarter or uh, through the quarter around to that semifinal round. Something to watch next weekend when the Atlas and War Dogs go at it on Saturday. What a hot take. Much more on the games next Friday. What would you say? What a hot take, buddy. Give me a hot take. Atlas should roll with Kyle Russo, even right. if Con Cannon's healthy. Uh, you roll with the hot hand. This is you've seen it in pro lacrosse across the board. Unfortunately, a guy gets hurt, the other guy comes in and he plays lights out like Kyle Russo has. In my opinion, you roll with the hot hand, and you have a guy like Con Cannon who you know can come in and once again, if Kyle, if a run get happens on Kyle Russo, you know he can Con Cannon can come in and. See, you know, he takes up so much of the dang cage. You know he's going to come in and play lights out. But right now, Kyle Russo is taking advantage of the opportunity. I don't think it, it's hard for me to sit him right now. I know a lot of people are going to question that, but we've seen it all the time back in MLL, even here in the PLL. you got to roll with the hot hand, man. And I think the Atlas should stick with Kyle Russo. I say don't. Don't fix something that's not broken, right? Absolutely. So I think they should roll with him until otherwise. There you I'll, I'll go the other way on that. I I say Ruby Orr gets – he got practice right before, and, yeah. and Ruby Orr just goes up. He says, hey, I got two goalies in one goal. You dial in your goalie. <laughs> you get competition going on the team, right? So – so they're dialed in. Whoever wins is going to get that spot. I mean, you're you're not messing around anymore. You throw some stakes on there uh, on, you know, whoever's going to win that goalie battle. You either play well here in practice, you get the start, or you, or you don't. You lose to the guy next to you, you're not going to get the start. Get him focused up in practice. You find the momentum there. You roll it over into the game and, and see what happens from there. I, I like the competition aspect of it because they're both such good goalies. Um, and it's not like Ken Cannon was – 
was playing, you know, terrible lacrosse this season. I think that Cannon's always been good, especially inside, you know, finishers. He's probably the best goalie in the league when guys get, you know, five yards in front of the goal. So, I mean, if I'm Rubio, get some competition going, headed right into the playoffs too. You got a top seed. Don't let your guys relax. Get them focused. Get them dialed in. And, I mean, you're trying to win a championship. Hey, look, you know, we would not be talking about a guy like Kyle Burnmore if Bear Davis didn't stick with his hot hand um, in the playoffs back in 2017, if I'm right. I know I could be wrong, 27. Yeah, 2017, where Scott Rogers got hurt. They went with Burnmore, the, uh, the young guy. And when Scott Rogers was healthy, they kept at it with Burnmore, who won them their first championship. So like Harry said, you could get – you could practice, have it go that way. Either way, you can't go wrong, but just it's been done before. And Absolutely. who knows, could this be J.D. Colarusso's time if the Atlas go far and he wins them a championship? We could be seeing the start of something for J.D. Colarusso, or we could see the Jack and Cannon, the 6'5 manimal who does his thing, and they can still win a championship. So it's a good problem to have. Absolutely. And can you, you look at J.D. Colarusso's story. We talked about it on Tuesday. It's it's he was a uh, pra- or I shouldn't say pra- I guess he was he was he was a player pool player uh, in back in 2019, spent the entire season on the player pool. I believe he did kind of just bounce around teams practices. Uh, he was the the emergency goalie last summer in the champ- championship series out in Utah. Pretty much of a goalie was to get hurt. Uh, he was to replace that goalie on that team, uh, just as that emergency goalie, finally getting his chance on the Atlas this season. Uh, and and we've seen him now dominate through the, his first three games, first two weekends, and he might go into week eight here, obviously, with a chance to defend that number one seed, give his team the Atlas, the top seed going into the playoffs. But on Cannon's status, it's it's still unknown heading into this weekend. But as we're saying, can't imagine that Rubier is too worried if his starting goalie needs to be held out an additional week so that he's healthy for the playoffs. If he can be healthy for the playoffs, as I'd imagine he's comfortable right now with what he has in J.D. Colarusso. Obviously, Jordan's saying they should stick with Colarusso. Harry's saying open competition, whoever is the better goalie there out of, out of the uh, the practice. Again, we'll hopefully have much more on Con Cannon next week as the Atlas gets set to try to defend first place and clinch it for the playoffs if they beat the Water Dogs and Jordan, we talked about it on Tuesday's PLL Flash. The Atlas have surprised so many this season in how fast this retool, rebuild, whatever you want to call it, the speed and how fast and swift it was for the rookies to all step up and how they have. It's it, it's it's awesome to watch and obviously very entertaining. But with the questions surrounding Con Cannon, I know you said you like Colorado, but if the Atlas are to go into the playoffs with JD in goal, what do you see their chances as in making a run at, the, at this championship game, especially if they're able to get the free pass to that semifinal? Just as I said, they still have the same chances, whether they're going Kyle Russo or Con Cannon. I don't think it makes a difference. When you have a guy like Rex Road, Tucker Durkin in front of them, uh, Cade Van Rapport, that defense has been able to hold it down. I think a lot of people talk about the young guys on the offense for the Atlas, but you have those vets in – Rex Road, Tucker Durkin, who you know is just going to take his game up another level in the playoffs. And then a guy like Kate Van Rapport, who we can say has been here. He's been through the highs and lows with the Atlas. He's finally going to get his chance to sign, to shine. And then a guy like Trevor Baptiste, who, you know, as we saw in Colorado Springs, and as we've seen in his college career and early on in his pro career, he's going to allow you to play make it, take it, right? So – Again, and then you talk about that offense. I mean, a guy like Jake Caraway, as much as I was rooting for him coming out of Annapolis, he surprised me. You know, I didn't think he was going to have this much success this early. And then a guy like Costabile, who can go both ways. And then we finally saw Docs get, un- get unlocked. And so, I mean, this Atlas team right now, we have to say that they are the team to beat right now based on the play, right? I would think so. I mean, if you want to throw a team like the Archers in there, at their best, they can be the team to beat. A team like the Redwoods can be there at their best, can be the team to beat. But right now, I wouldn't, and I hate to say the word peaking because that sounds like you got to come down at some point. But the Atlas are truly playing their best lacrosse right now. And so you can't, you can't go wrong either way in goal just because of what all the all-around talent 
that this team has and sort of that all-around talent that has shot a lot of people and came together rather quickly. I think you also, too, have to talk a lot about what Ken Clawson has <clears throat> added to this team, you know, from a coaching staff standpoint. The Atlas defense did not look great until this season, uh, and, and I think Rubio finally found his guy at, at defensive coordinator for this team um, because, yeah, I mean, they do have some new personnel, um, but, I mean, Tucker Durkin has, has been on this defense. You know, he's been the leader of it since the beginning, and they've really found their footing this year. I think the goaltending has always been there for the Atlas. They were just getting burnt on matchups and off ball, and this year it's not been the same. And, you know, Danny Logan, I think, has been an awesome short stick D midi. Um, we've seen him even produce some points as well on the other end. Uh, I know I'm getting into a little bit of what Jordan talked about, too. But, I mean, the evolution of Brian Costabile has just been spectacular. He's been an awesome draft pick for the Atlas. And then just offensively, it, it really helps. And you can throw Jeff Teed in there. But, yeah, Ken Clausen, I mean, I mean, props to this guy for coming in and establishing a new defense. And then we just look at the top of the coach there, tree there in Ben Rubio with, you know, kind of the everybody eats mentality. Uh, it, it's worked out swimmingly for this team. And, yeah, they're, I think they're the team to beat right now with that, without a question in my mind. The Atlas will be among the two or three teams vying for that top spot going into the playoffs. Again, a win, and they secure it, and they'll be able to watch the rest of the field battled out in the quarterfinals for the remaining three spots in the semifinals. A loss on Saturday, that would be that being next Saturday to the Water Dogs. The farthest they could fall is four, most likely uh, falling to three, depending on obviously what the Redwoods goal differential likes, depending on what uh, the records look like. So we'll see how that all plays out. The Chrome and Cannons uh, that weekend, that same Saturday, will be playing in an elimination game. Both teams at two and six. Uh, goal, score differential really and, and that regard in terms of who will make this this last playoff spot doesn't really matter obviously uh, the winner that would get factored in with the chaos depending on how the chaos uh, play there in week eight but winner making the playoffs the loser being eliminated obviously we talked about the chrome bringing in Nick Grill Will Haas has missed some time here over the last uh, I believe just this past weekend he missed he missed both of those games he's currently unknown here uh, his status for this, for this elimination game against the Cannons. But, Jordan, you look at, at this matchup, Chrome Cannons. The Chrome, it feels it, it feels like they're limping uh, to the finish line here in, in a way, but obviously bringing in Nick Grill, hoping to, to get some help there defensively uh, down low in front of John Galloway. Yeah, I mean, it does feel like all things are kind of crashing down for the Chrome, but I do think the one advantage that they do have is if they can get an early read on the Cannons, um, that could play well for them. I think you heard about it in Paul Rabel's press conference where he said these teams have gotten early leads on the cannons and they've had to fight back and they just haven't had enough steam at the end. And at this point in the season, I think that's the type of team that they are. If you know, if you're able to get an early lead on them, yeah, they might come back on you. But you know, in a lot of these comebacks, you just run out of steam right there at the end trying to tie it. And that's why they've gotten into these one goal games. Um so that could be an advantage for them. I mean, obviously, you insert a guy like Nick Grill into the, into the defense, that certainly can only help, especially if a guy like Jesse Bernhardt isn't there. And, you know, even if he is there, people forget that uh, Jesse Bernhardt was Nick Grill's coach. So, you know, you talk about some of the things like chemistry and whatnot. I mean, having your old college coach on the field can only help you, right? So, uh defensively, I think that could play well for them. Offensively, we know they've been struggling, but you have another week of Dylan Malloy in that can only help with that chemistry. If Colin Heacock returns to his normal self, guy like Madursky, as you mentioned before, they have the, the ability to do it, especially on a Cannons defense that is suspect. I mean, could they make a trade? I feel like I've been ringing this bell for three weeks now. I would say that they probably won't. So their defense kind of just is what it is at this point, and they have the weapons to take advantage of it. So, you know, could this game be another offensive shootout, maybe hit the over? Probably. You know, at this point in the year, you're going to be laying it on – both of these teams are going to be laying it on the line, whatever they have. So I'm sure we'll probably see plenty of twos and plenty of penalties in this game because that's what happens when you get teams that are at the bottom of the league. You – trying to fight for a playoff spot. You basically get a scrap fest. And so this is not necessarily going to be that defensive scrap fest, I don't think, but I think it's going to be sort of that high-scoring affair. We're going to see 
lots of being main plays, you know, the, the type of hits that, you know, are going to make Sports Center, going to make the highlight reels. I'm sure the chirping will be at an all time high when you have teams fighting for a playoff spot, especially the way this thing goes, where it's going to be a win or go home type of deal. So, on the Cannon side, if they can get their midfield right, if Paul Rabel can get back to, to I would say, his usual self this year, had himself a quiet game, you know, he's wearing that knee brace. You have to wonder if that knee or leg is still bugging him. We saw Lyle Thompson get back to his usual self, so another week off can certainly help those guys. And so, I mean, they just have to click. We know what their offense can be at their best when guys like – Rabel, Lyle, Drenner at their best, Shane Jackson being a great sort of midseason come along for them. Um, They have to peak right now on offense. They have to be at their best because, as we can see, that team runs and goes through that offense. If that offense is not hitting, they are going to get down early and they will have to fight back. And so far they have not been able to do that. So if they can get an early lead – that's going to be the key for them. If the Chrome get an early lead, the Chrome are probably going to be the ones to win that game. I don't think uh, anybody wants to win this game more than Paul Rabel. When you look at the history of the last two years of the league, I mean, the only time the guys made the playoffs was last year when everybody made the playoffs. All you had to do was test negative for COVID-19 and stay healthy through the, the pool play, and you were going to play in the playoffs. I mean, Paul Rabel's teams um, have been – disappointing for a guy who you know is a co-owner of the league so I think that there's a lot of motivation there for Paul Rabel to uh, get to the playoffs because again he failed to do that in the league's first year and the guy who um, you know is you he he jumps on another podcast they're going to call him the greatest of all time I mean that might be up for debate in this podcast but when you look elsewhere when he goes and talks about the league with other people and, and, and the type of credentials that they introduce him as, you know, as the type of lacrosse player that he is. Um, I think it's fair to say it'd be pretty underwhelming if he hasn't won a playoff game in his first three years in this league. So I think that Rabel is going to be super motivated to come away with a win here and just get to the playoffs because it's something that, you know, unless all teams are going, he hasn't been able to get there so far. Absolutely. A ton of weapons on this Cannons team. We thought, uh, obviously, you know, expansion team, we, we knew there would be uh, some some hurdles, some some bumps in the road, but obviously uh, they came out of the gates firing. Uh, if, if it wasn't a win for the Cannons, it seemed like it was a one or a two goal loss. Obviously, they took that that tough loss midseason to the Water Dogs. Uh, but, you know, all these weapons, it's kind of like it, it, it'd be, it would be very surprising if the Cannons did not make the playoffs just when it's all said and done. Uh, but we will see as that goes. But we will talk much more next week as well about the Chrome and Cannons. Obviously, an elimination game. Winner moves on. The loser is eliminated from the 2021 playoffs. Obviously, before the playoffs start, they'll be watching from home and awarded the first overall pick in the 2022 college draft before we finish up here let's shift gears a little bit talk some college across because we do talk college across here on this show try to keep updated with uh everything that's going on in the college across world before next spring we have a ton of transfer news that we won't exactly dive into right now we're going to probably save that for when the PLO season's up but someone that did break over the week brian holman has stepped down as the utah head coach coming kind of as a, a uh out of nowhere kind of news breaking. Uh, obviously, they have uh, three PLL pros, three archers uh, in Will Manny, Marcus Holman, and Adam Gittleman on that Utah coaching staff. Obviously, Utah just becoming a Division One college lacrosse team just a couple years ago. But Jordan, Brian Holman stepping down, definitely big news uh, for the University of Utah and college lacrosse as uh, we, we look ahead to the 2022 spring. Uh, for sure. I mean, you definitely look at it. Do they keep do they keep and promote a guy like Will Manny, who has now experience coaching both sides of the ball as he was uh, took over as defensive coordinator last year? Do they maybe give a guy like Adam Gilman a look who has had success at Harvard uh, back before he got to Utah? Maybe it is Marcus Holman that stays in Salt Lake City as the head coach, despite maybe not necessarily having as much coaching experience as a guy like Will Manny or Gittleman, or do they go outside of the tree and sort of switch things up a little bit, sort of like Michigan did uh, when John Paul resigned as they were making the transition to D1 
And as we've seen so far with Kevin Conroy, they've sort of been on an up and up. And I think if you look at that as kind of the blueprint, that's kind of the goal, I would think, with the new coach coming in is show progress, right? You know, you're moving into now the A-Sun Conference where for the first time in their history, they have a legit shot at making the NCAA tournament via the automatic qualifier. And so certainly this team who has hung around with Denver, they've hung around with some of the bigger programs that they played um, over the years. I mean, and at the end of the day, it's just about talent, right? You've got to, they've got to continue their positive momentum that they've had on the recruiting trail. You look at some of their 2022, 2023 classes that have sort of started to come together. I know we don't know a ton about the 23s yet, but the 2021s and 2022s, as they've really been able to sort of branch their footprint, getting talent out west to come to Utah. Of course, you know they're going to go out east and recruit and recruit well. But if they can sort of open up the west, have that California, Arizona, Nevada area really help elevate the talent, I think that's another underrated aspect of the coaching aspect in college across is that especially in an area like Utah, you've got to get a guy that's going to come in and help, whether it's the help the high schools, help the club programs out there sort of develop. So that way you can feed talent into your school over the years. So it's going to be interesting to see in which direction that they go in. I mean, you can't go wrong with living in Salt Lake city. Um, so whoever gets that job is certainly going to have their hands full, but they'll be living in one of the nicest places in the U S. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's big. Uh, you know, Brian Holman gets gets them to this point, right? He he gets them where they're knocking on the door against teams like Denver, as Jordan mentioned. And now, you know, this is a critical point in the early stages of Utah lacrosse is finding the the right head coach that's going to unlock that next tier of competition that you want your team to reach, right? You want to be competing for that AQ. I mean, how cool would it be? to see Utah be the first team to snag that AQ in the A-Sun and, and see them all of a sudden in an NCAA tournament. That would be really cool, but you don't get there without, I think, the right coaching hire here. Um, and I think that, you know, that may be within the program, maybe outside of the program. I really uh, personally, so far removed from college lacrosse this season that I don't know what might be the best direction for them to take it in. Uh, I think that's one thing that kind of makes this tough for them is the fact that, you know, now in August that Holman is stepping away, it does kind of make it a little bit difficult to, if you're going to go outside of Utah to find your next head coaching hire, because, you know, a lot of the the shuffling of head coaches, at least the major moves, happens not long after the, the season ends. I mean, you, you look at how quickly things changed at Syracuse. So who knows where this head coaching situation is going to wind up. I would bet um, that it's within the program, and I, I'm sure a lot of people around there kind of knew that you know, Brian Holman, that, that this last year was his last year, and he was just kind of kind of planning, you know, how he was going to resign and when he was going to do it. But whatever the next hire is, whoever the next guy is to step in and command that sideline uh, is going to be really important for this program moving forward. And I think just lacrosse as a whole and the growth of the sport, um, I think everybody's rooting for Utah to succeed because if they can find success on the national stage, you get some other Pac-12 teams that might say, hey, wait a minute, can can we find something here? Can we do something with this? I mean, who knows? But, I mean, the more teams that we can get playing the sport is great. The more parity we can have in the sport is great. And when we get these teams out west who, you know, can put themselves in a national stage, like who knows if Utah is able to do that someday, it could be huge, especially when you think about trying to get more of these Power 5 conferences to join, which is way down the line. Um, but this next coaching hire could have some major impacts on, on the growth of the sport. Absolutely. You, you mentioned the Pac-12, obviously other Power 5 schools. I mean, SEC, we could see see some schools say, hey, let's let's do lacrosse in terms of the SEC. Uh, you know, obviously hey, great stuff that we want to see down the line. Hey, yeah. look at a team like Clemson with the women. If, if that program is able to get up and running – uh, that could be a great case for them to go to their athletic department and potentially get a men's team. Um, so just keep an eye out on that South, man. 
a big uh, big rival is Clemson of my South Carolina Gamecocks. But yes, we will see if if uh, obviously hoping that Clemson's women's lacrosse team uh, is successful. Uh, we'll see if they decide. Obviously, Clemson, ton of other schools uh, in the area. I mean, uh, I'll talk University of South Carolina Gamecocks. We were the 2019 SCLC. I might not have gotten the uh, the the league right there, but we were the champions. Uh, the, the 2019 Gamecocks. So we will see, obviously, a lot of uh, a lot holding on this Utah coaching decision who they end up replacing Brian Holman with. We will follow that and provide updates as we know. But shifting back to the PLL, a bye weekend coming up this week. But if you're looking for that lacrosse itch and lacking it, you don't have to look too far. The OJLL holds its semifinal and championship this weekend, along with its full Futures Division games, you can check them out on social media and YouTube. Obviously, Pat Gregoire uh, broadcasting, announcing those games. A lot of our uh, guys on our Flash staff are involved with the OJLL, so they'll be they'll be wrapping up their uh, three week season this weekend. So a lot to look forward to there. Team USA has been training out in Lake Placid for sixes. We're getting a ton of awesome highlights from camp out there, and then NLL free agency is in full force. Make sure to check out Lacrosse Classified to catch up with some of the biggest moves that have gone down in the opening week of free agency as they recapped a couple of those on their show earlier this week. And then athlete, the uh, Athletes limit, Unlimited excuse me, will be holding week three of the women's lacrosse season led by captains Kayla Wood, Dempsey Arsenal, Brittany Reed, and Kylie Oldmiller, who threw out the first pitch Jordan at the Washington Nationals game this week. I know you've been following the AU women closely over these first two weekends. What should we be looking forward to this weekend as the AU women hit the halfway point of their 2021 season? Um, Yeah, you know, you hit right there with Kayla Wood, who has been in her, I guess, inaugural season like everyone else. She's just had a coming out party, right? Didn't have the greatest college career, but now is really just taking over over and dominated as a pro. I mean, with her draft this week, I mean, she drafted Michelle Tumalo, Alex Oster, and her debut had six plus goals. Man, you get a guy, or you get a girl like Katie O'Donnell, excuse me, um, who has been a captain, who we know can score. Has been at the top of that leaderboard. That leaderboard fluctuates so much, and that just speaks to the amount of talent. And also, shout out to that team at Athletes Unlimited because. They've listened to the people who have had a hard time sort of following that point system. And over the last couple of weeks, they've made it more of an emphasis on that, their broadcast and through their social to explain how it works, to show the breakdowns after each game, during each game. And even you show the players picking on the tablets for the MVP. I think that's one of the coolest parts of this league. I mean, but if I'm going to pick a team that I think is going to have a solid weekend – I look at Team Wood. I mean, as I talked about, Michelle Tumalo, Alex Loss, you can't go wrong there. And then on defense, you have uh, somebody like Ella Simpkins, who is just one of the best defenders in women's lacrosse and can go both ways. Um, so that's certainly like one of the most underrated pickups. I think she may be one of, the, one of the most underrated players in this league until, you know, maybe she makes a highlight play or whatnot. She's just going to do the dirty work which, you know, you need those type of players on your team. And then even look on offense even further, like with Izzy McMahon, who's had a great rookie season, despite, you know, she got the late call for this league, wasn't expected to play, but has come in and sort of not necessarily shot a lot of people, but had some early success. And, you know, maybe she is one of the players in contention, I believe, for that Rookie of the Year award, which I believe comes with a sweet bonus. So you can't go wrong there. <laughs> We are uh, very excited. Looking forward to this week three of AU Sports. Definitely follow along some of those storylines that Jordan just listed off as they enter the halfway point, or I should say get to the halfway point of their 2021 summer season. We're also very excited to see how the final weekend of the season for the PLL shakes out. And like I said before, we'll be back next Friday with Goal Line Extended to look ahead to the weekend. But Harrison, Jordan, I want to thank you both for joining me today as we reflect on the trade that sends Justin Gutterding to the Whip Snakes and we talk some injuries heading into the bye week as we have one more regular season weekend to go before the playoffs. But that is going to do it for today's show. I want to thank you all for watching and or listening. If you are not already, make sure to subscribe to Goal Line Extended on YouTube and hit that notification bell so that you get notified of future shows. You can also follow along on Instagram and Twitter at GL Extended. All the links that you will need will be in the description in of, of the video or podcast that you are watching or listening to 
right now and make sure to head on over to lacrosseflash.com as well as the lacrosse flash youtube channel you can check out all of our content recapping last weekend's games which will include the pll flash our weekly power rankings jordan's stars of the week and noah lands hot and cold segment make sure to check all of that out as we look to get you ready for week eight of the uh premiere lacrosse league or and then ahead to the premier lacrosse league playoffs as i said before we will be back next friday with goal line extended so make sure to like follow and subscribe so that you don't miss any of it i hope you all have a fantastic weekend and we will talk to you next friday cheers follow the show on twitter and instagram at gl extended and subscribe to the show on any of your favorite podcast outlets you can find lacrosse flash on twitter instagram and facebook and online at lacrosseflash.com 